Again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. I am especially excited because our presenter, Bill Payson, is a friend of mine. Um, a lot of you, well, maybe some of you may know that my husband and I, on occasion, like to put on 18th century clothing and uh, do a little reenacting, and so does Bill. So that was one of the things that Bill and I have in common, and we actually had this really great plan this year as part of the Bicentennial. We were going to organize this wonderful event at the Camden Public Library where we were gonna do a walk through history. Unfortunately, that had to be postponed, but Bill was kind enough to do this Zoom program for us instead. And so tonight he's going to be talking about the muskets of the American Revolution. And I'm going to read you a little bit about Bill. Bill Payson has been involved with historic reenacting since 1990. He began as a member of the 1st and 2nd New Hampshire regiments. The last 20 years, Payson has been a member of Harmon's Snowshoemen, and I suspect there might be a few of the Harmon's Snowshoemen guys here tonight a group of New England military reenactors who portray frontier soldiers from 1623 to 1783. Payson is a board member of the, Paul, the Colonel Paul Wentworth House, an educational and cultural center in Rollinsford, New Hampshire. And if you hadn't had an opportunity to visit there yet, I highly recommend it. And he collaborated with author Dennis Hambucken, and I apologize if I said that wrong, on the book, Soldier of the American Revolution, a visual reference. And Bill will tell you a little bit more about that book at the end of this program. So again, without further ado, I'd like to hand the program over to my friend, Bill. Huzzah! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's empty, it's empty. <laughs> oh, <damn>. Mine's not. <laughs> who's, who's joining us this evening from his lovely tavern in Camden. So, <laughs> welcome, Bill. Thank you. Hi. Okay, now. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you, Okay. Yeah. All right, so I'll go to share then? Yeah, we're going to go hit that green button at the bottom of your screen first. It says share screen. And double click. And there we go. And then present. Okay. Perfect. It's, it's, there it is. Modern technology. Wow. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about uh, muskets of the revolution, probably mostly the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, like with Concord and Lexington, uh, your militias had a variety of different types of weapons from mostly followers. We call them shotguns today, but a follower is a weapon that you could use for bird hunting, deer hunting, even large game hunting. Uh, I'm not too sure I'd want to try to shoot a bear with a single shot though. Uh, so the top gun here is a representative, it's a uh, English style uh, New England fowler. This one is, uh, has a 46 inch barrel, 69 caliber, and this is a reproduction. And the next one here is the Brown Bess weapon. First model they call it, also it's the real name for it is the British infantry musket. And then we have the French infantry musket. And we have a closer picture of the locks. You can see the locks are pretty much the same. The older locks had a banana shape and then they went to a straighter, this is your French lock. Some of this later on in the, in the uh, British locks went to a straight bottom on this. But anyway, there's, there's minor changes, and we'll get into that. Let's go to the next screen here. Oh, so I think to start things off to get a better understanding of what was being carried, we can look at some of the uh, militia orders of the time. And one thing I'd like to point out is, well, here's a few things. And just like we were just talking about, this guy from Lynn uh, was observing troops marching by, and he, he, he could pick out, several different types of, of weapons. Uh, Queen, Queen Anne's arms, which would be in the, the brown best that we know, French arms probably captured in the, in the French and Indian War 20 years earlier, even, even a Spanish. And also uh, a lot of the guns carried by uh, colonists were Dutch uh, trade guns. Um, and here's something I'd like to point out is a uh, they were banned. We think that they didn't have a lot of bayonets, but this is just one company in, uh, in Massachusetts, and about a quarter of them had bayonets. And some of the other uh, militia groups had their own uh, blacksmiths who would make the make uh, bayonets and fit them to various different guns so they would could work. But on the most part, they most of them did not have a bayonet, so that's why they part of the orders were to they had to have a musket in good repair. This one's a lot, four pounds of lead bullets is a lot, actually. 
and this is what I keep seeing over and over again, fitted to the bore of the piece. And you see it again, fit to the bore of their guns. It also was they had four flints, cutlass, or tomahawk as a fighting weapon, uh, a good belt around his body, canvas knapsack, and uh, one pound of powder. This one has 24 balls to fit their guns. And I think we have another one. And that's it. Okay, and well, let's see. Are we in the right spot? Here's this, well, we'll just, that might be in the wrong place, but here's a, just a comparison of the different sizes. Here's a, a 20 gauge or a 62 caliber, a 69 caliber for the French musket and a 75 caliber for the British musket, and, and this is what we fought World War One and World War Two, as you can as you can see as a comparison. And we'll get back to more of that on how the impact of these balls. Good. Let me just back up a minute. I think I might have skipped something. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, also, the just the mentioning mentioning about the uh, balls fit to their. Uh, uh, the bore of their gun. There were so many different types of, of, of uh, muskets being carried, particularly the privately owned, because militia had to provide their own weapons. So whatever they had, it could have been their grandfather's gun, or, or, or the cost of a gun was about five to seven pounds, which is quite a lot of money back then when your average income was maybe 25 pounds a year. So they didn't just go out to Walmart and buy a gun, they would just keep it in the family as long as it worked. But the problem with the uh, Militia, especially once the war started, lead was becoming scarce. Uh, if the ball didn't fit, they had to pound this into a shape that would fit. This took me almost five minutes to do. So I think what they mostly did was just, because if you had a whole company of men doing this, let's say a hundred men doing it, you could have, in five minutes you'd have a hundred rounds that would fit. But it would only matter for the muskets that didn't have the right fitting ball. I think in a hurry, they just make something that would go down the barrel probably loosely. And then another thing that mentioned in one of those orders was, uh, let's go back to that just real quick. Um, buckshot, buckshot, buckshot. Anyway, yeah, buckshot, 10,000 pieces of buckshot. And I think that probably is another way to solve the problem of musket balls not really fitting because you know, we have, at least for the people who didn't have the right size of ammunition, you had plenty of buckshot. And you could put, they would range in size from uh, oh, BB size to about a third of an inch, but the average would probably be around a quarter of an inch. So you could put five or six of those down the barrel. You'd have to wad it once you loaded it. And even at 100 yards, you're probably going to hit something. Um, so and then we'll go here. And, and the reason for uh, just a couple of pictures of how the things were done. Imagine this line as three or four hundred people long shooting against the, and these. So we're talking about there's a lot of uh, in recently a lot of uh, discussion on some of the reenactor groups about the accuracy of the weapons and uh, thought that they probably didn't start firing to till within 150 yards, but. That's pretty close when you think about it. I read recently too that uh, in on the European battlegrounds they were firing at distances of starting to fire at 600 yards, which is that's pretty fast. That's about the limit of the range of that musket, unless you'd have to really angle it up. But think about uh, I did a walk today. I took uh, it took me f less, just slightly less than a minute to walk 100 yards at a brisk pace. So if you've got a line of British soldiers marching against the line of American soldiers or French soldiers, it doesn't matter which, uh, at that same brisk. You could, if you started at 600 yards, within a minute you close that gap by 200 yards. And then within th three minutes, you're within 100, you're all, just about 100 yards away. So let's say we, in, a, in the colonies where you didn't have all this room like they had in uh, Europe, if you started at 300 yards, which is seems like a long way, but it's they could start their firing the volleys at that point, because the effective range of the, of the muskets was about 300 yards, shooting at a general target, more like 180 to 100 yards shooting at specific targets, if, if you aimed and practiced with your aim. Uh, so the, really the effect of this is uh, to, to 
load to fire a, a massive amount of lead at the enemy the, and the people that whichever side could do that quicker would gain an advantage on the field the british claimed to have been able to shoot at five rounds a minute which is pretty difficult i don't think the head could be bothering to ram a, uh, anything to, for that speed that's that's pretty quick so the average would be about three rounds so if you started uh, let's say at 300 yards two lines facing each other, marching toward each other. That's, and if they stopped every, let's say, 30 seconds to fire within, a, let's say, your first minute, you're going to be, you're going to have 100 yards left. So you've maybe fired two rounds. And, and by that point, the British would maybe fire one last round and charge at, at a full speed trot with the bayonets. The bayonet was really on the field, was really the deciding weapon other than the muskets. Because of, at that point, you're t it, there's no time to reload anyway. So you're within uh, within a few seconds, they're all fighting hand-to-hand. Uh, -hand. And these are, so we just, let's go. This gives you a nice, so if you, uh, the average uh, regiment was probably, it was about 600 men. So you could have a 200-man front. British usually f uh, fielded, uh, in three ranks, the first rank could would kneel, the second rank would fire, and then the third rank would fire behind it. But they would probably not fire all at once. You'd fire by section or by company. So as you're marching along, there's a constant rate of fire going across the field uh, for maximum effect. And so now we'll come to a, let's get let's figure out what is a what is a flintlock. This is the a typical flintlock. Uh, the, uh, and I'll, I'll point out some of the parts. This is called a frizzen. It's, a, it's really ger German for hammer or striker. If you're familiar with lighting a fire with uh, flint and steel, you strike the, f the flint with the striker. It kind of does this in here. The flint would go in here wrapped with a piece of leather or lead. When you pull the trigger, this would come forward quickly, scraping metal off of that, which is your spark, and pushing that back. Then you have the inside, you know, back up again. This is the spring here. This is the frozen spring. Once it gets to a certain point, this spring pushes it back and keeps it there. And the internal mechanism, this is your main spring. Uh, and this it looks like it's at full cock, but it would have a, a half cock, which means you could put it on half cock, which is a safety. Then you could load it and carry it without worrying about it going off. But sometimes that half cock, it's a little small notch in here would get worn out and uh, it could go off if you bump the gun, if you touch the trigger too hard, and that would be called uh, going off half cock. That's where that phrase came from. So when the trigger mechanism on the inside would be under here and the, when you push pull the trigger, it would push up on this lever here and release this and this would come forward again. And and then there's the outside, here's your, your the cock really, and here's your piece, a nice piece of flint wrapped in leather. You could wrap it in lead. I prefer the leather because it gives you more. These screw down tightly. So you have to screw it down pretty tight. But if you don't have something in there to give it a grip, it's going to move every time it hits. It's coming down with a really good force. So what you have is, uh, this is a piece of leather. And uh, that screws down very tight. This is at half cock, it looks like. And here's a good and this would be the pan. This is a, this is an open position. There's a, this is what they call a touch hole. When you, this is a small hole that goes from the pan into the barrel where your charge has been rammed into right down in the spot inside the barrel. This is just about at the very edge of the breech. So uh, when the sparks ignite the powder in the pan, the, the flame goes into the barrel. If, if it's clean, the, the problem is you have to keep that clean after about, Especially in warm weather, after about five or six shots, you sort of start wipe. You have to wipe all these, wipe and brush all these things off because every shot you fire just gunks everything all up. So if this isn't clean, what you're going to get is just a flash, and that's the expression "flash in the pan." You have a lot of flash but no action. This is this was a common problem. So, and I will show the uh, the tools for those uh, as we progress here. And there's another one in the fired position. And, and these, uh, let, me go, let me back up. This is a, for reenacting, you have to have a flash guide. Uh, in the 18th century, I believe there's only maybe one British regiment uh, 
documented to actually have these. So a lot of people got badly burned from that. Uh, a few people, uh, Morgan of Morgan Rifles, he had he was badly scarred, and and people had lots of accidents with these, uh, especially if they're you know you're just standing shoulder to shoulder with somebody and they have too much powder in the pan, uh, it's going to burn that side of your face. And this is your spark right here. And I found this cool little video the other day on. Uh, There you go. That's throwing in quite a bit of sparks. And this is all very quickly through a year. Uh, by the time those sparks hit the pan, you, the gun is already fired. There may be a hundredth of a second uh, delay. If there's a bigger delay, then you know you have uh, your touch hole needs to be cleaned. And here we get some more big shards of flint here. There were two types of flint. The black English flint was very popular. I, and then we had the other. This is a French flint. But these are large pieces. Recently, I saw, I forget where, I think it was an antique shop, it was a, a soccer ball size of, of flint. The outside is, is white, but the inside is black. Then you have the French we're using another type, which they call blonde flint, which is a, a, almost translucent. We'll go to the next slide, and that shows the difference here. I think, right, I'm not sure, but I, I think that possibly the black flint could be napped into a sharper edge. You can get a razor edge on these and a lot of rain actors get cuts on their fingers if they're not careful. It's a very sharp piece. And here's some more. And here's some uh, different ways to wrap. Now this is a piece of lead you can, those can be pounded out of a ball into a flat surface and you cut a hole in the middle to accommodate that uh, screw, which I show you back here again. Oh, back, too far. Ah, oh, missing it. Bad. Okay, there's the screw. So you, if you don't have that hole in there, you, you know, it could push the flint too far forward because when you're at half cock, this is not supposed to touch here. If it does, then it's going to partially open your pan and you can lose some, some of your, your priming that way. So back, back up again, back up, back up. Okay, so th there we have the hole. What I like to do when I did some live shooting, I've live shot these all these weapons. Uh, I like to glue the glue the piece of leather right on there. So, and if if you have to change a flint in the middle of the battle, it's a lot easier to b pick up the flint out of your bag that already has the leather on it, and not have to worry about dropping it and fumbling with it. And it goes right into the jaws of the uh, of the lock. And this so this would be lead and different lead. And here's your French flint again, different sizes. The British and French musket had almost an inch wide flint on it. It's a pretty good sized chunk. And here we go, we're back to the uh, Fowler again. <coughs> and this is, uh, again, 69 caliber. Uh, I think the barrel length, uh, barrel length is 46 inches, which is pretty long. It was originally earlier on, it was thought that the longer the barrel, the better the uh, uh, Accuracy would be, but it was found that that really didn't make a whole lot of difference. So, so uh, shorter weapons were being uh, developed, but uh, and this is the original that this is uh, based off of. This, uh, my wife got this at a barn sale 40 years ago for five bucks. <laughs> Kid, the kids were playing with it. <laughs> this is not the original lock. It looked to me, I don't have the closer picture, but I think it had a, a large English lock in there. Some of the other parts, I believe, are French probably taken from uh, Louisburg or from the French and Indian War, captured pieces. And whoever did it restart, some of the brass is missing, but it's got nice engraving on it, which was reproduced. This is also, you know, cherry, which is darkened through, well, it's 200 years old. And you can see part of the, uh, the original space for the log is much bigger than this reproduction when it's on there. Everything else on it is the original though. Uh, but back again, you can see that it's shorter. They said, this has been cut down. And the guy who made this is Jeff Miller. I don't know if he's watching tonight, but the, uh, he figured by the spacing of these ramrod tubes that, that it was missing one, that this should have been longer. So he, he estimated it to be about a 40, 60 inch barrel. But in New England, it's a lot easier to go through the woods with a shorter barrel than a, uh, than a long barrel. And uh, in fact, uh, Rogers Rangers would, would automatically cut their barrels down by six to eight inches to make them more, uh, serve, more less cumbersome, let's say. 
So now we go back again. So, and now we're going, going into the uh, Brown Bess or English Long Land Service Infantry Weapon. Uh, the term Brown Bess didn't come around till probably the end of the 17th century, 18th century, and nobody knows what it referred to. Uh, some people think because they get rusty, but that I don't think is true because uh, the British over, they, they scrubbed those barrels ad nauseum. They would just yeah. almost wear them out. You got to remember that today's barrels are bored out of a solid piece of metal. Back then it was flat sheet iron. It was hammered and heated, hammered until, and formed around a form to make a, a barrel and then welded together along a seam. So they weren't all that thick. So, and we'll get into more how, how they cleaned them later. That's, that was one of the complaints about so the, the shelf life, let's say, of the musket may be diminished by 10 years by the over cleaning of the guns. And let's see what I'll get for, here's a closer picture. Uh, so in 1717, a guy named a gunsmith by the name of William Wilson came up with a design uh, which became the uh, go-to design or pattern for the uh, British infantry weapon. Before that, uh, they were, just farmed out as uh, many different things, uh, different makers. Also, a uh, colonel was responsible for buying these weapons. Sometimes they would take the money for that and buy inferior weapons and pocket the difference. Uh, so in an effort to make it more uh, standard, the uh, British actually were getting uh, locks and barrels from the Dutch for quite a while. They stockpiled them so that they got to the point where if the, when they sent out the contracts to be made, they would supply the locks and the barrels, then the, the smiths then would make do the rest of the parts. Uh, first ones were done in, in iron, but then quickly went to brass because it was cheaper and easier to work and didn't didn't say it take so long to polish. Now, uh, so you there's a tower with the way we marked tower and grace. Uh, some had the date on it, and, and later ones did not have the date. This I believe it says 1741. This is a reproduction of it. And go next slide. Now we go to the French. Let me go back though. There's some more information on the on the bass. Let, let me just uh, check my notes here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Here's some just a few statistics on the bass. Uh, so by 1722, it became the the pattern for the for the uh, British Army. Uh, they did come out with steel ramrods early on, but because they had so many wooden ramrods, that is the th one thing about the British, they never wasted anything. They didn't issue them actually until most or all of the wooden ramrods rods were used up. Uh, and also the same thing with, with the various, they would have different uh, stockpiles of other parts. You can find a, a, a brown vest with early dated or undated, a mix match of dates of, of parts because they would just not waste anything. Then when they finally came out with the, uh, once they got rid of, used as much, many of the uh, wooden ramrods that they could, then they started coming out with the uh, uh, a steel ramrod, but the, to, re to fit those back in, to fit them, they had to put a spring inside this tube to hold it because was was smaller than smaller in diameter than the wooden one, uh, but it still worked. Um, you might notice that this is a French. This is remember a reenactor thing. <laughs> that was the only one I had. So I had to. Put, if, if you're in reenacting, you have to have that on. Yeah, so again, they didn't use them in in the real world back in 1777. Now we come to the French Charlieville. Uh, I might have some more best history. Let me just double check it. Okay. Backing up again, sorry about that. Uh, effective range of the best, according to what I read recently, was 110 yards if you're aiming at a specific target. 300 to 330 yards with a line shooting at, a, at another line. So you, you're gonna hit something within that distance, maybe not, depending on how you, how you shoot. Uh, one thing about the ball, the size of the ball, the 75 caliber ball, uh, if 
it doesn't matter where it hit you. It just destroyed whatever it hit. If it hit an organ, it was, it was gone. Uh, if it, the thing with the, the round balls are soft lead. So when they hit, they, uh, they expand and cause even more damage. So the body is absorbing all of that kinetic energy. Whereas when you look at the uh, modern round, which is pointed, it can go right through you. A lot of the energy is still pushing that bullet through you, even though it's going to cause a pretty bad wound. But these balls are just, basically when you look at it, this is, this is about the same as a 20 millimeter can handheld cannon. So you're talking about a big, a big wound, if you get that. They think that uh, some of the estimated sizes of, or, or recorded size of the, the exit wound was about the size of a grapefruit. If it went through you, if it didn't go through you, and forget about it, it didn't matter that much. <laughs> and so now, now I'll go to the Charlieville musket. And if I have everything done. Yeah, the overall length of the, of the best was 61 inches. In about the same time, 1717, the French were developing what we call the Charlieville musket. It was what they would have called the uh, infantry, infantry musket, made by several different uh, makers. Uh, uh, Charlieville was just one of the armories that made them. The other one was St. Etienne, Toul, and uh, Maubourge. But uh, once they started coming over to the colonies during the war, they were all referred to as Charlieville muskets, but you could have different markings, different making markers, markers on there. 69 caliber, uh, 46 inch barrels, maybe slightly shorter. Total, the uh, total length is about 59 and a half inches. Um, uh, what else do we have here? What was different about it? Uh, the first muskets were made just like the uh, British ones where the barrel was pinned to the stock, but they soon came out with this here where they have these different, uh, these could be removed. And this is an advantage because uh, if you had a, needed to replace the barrel, for instance, these can, in two minutes, you could have this all off and, and I can show you how that works. This, well, first we'll go to the bayonets. We'll, we'll come back to the bayonets. It's Charlieville mocking. Oh, so the first, Charlievilles came to the uh, colonies in 1777. They, they sent 25,000 of them initially, and they came through Portsmouth. New Hampshire grabbed uh, uh, 3,000 of them, enough to, to arm the four uh, regiments that they were going to field. They only fielded three, but so, so they actually had. But they would mark them by regiment and, the, and rack number. Uh, and here we go. So this is what we have. This, see, this is a spring with a little pin. You can push on this, <clears throat> and that releases that. And you slide that off. And you do that for all three of them. And then just unscrew this, and the barrel will come right out. So they could replace the barrel. They could replace uh, all the lock. Everything was, re re was replaceable, uh, all made to be replaced from one to another, which made it a lot easier for. Uh, if you have battlefield or something, if you fall down and break your, your the stock, you can replace it in the field rather than having to send it back, like the British would have to do, because they had, they would have to send everything back. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. Well, can everybody still hear me? <laughs> yes, I can still hear you, Bill. Okay, how am I doing anyway? You're doing great. It's 6.30. <laughs> okay. Keep oh, going. wow, really? Already? <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to have to back up again. We're going to go to the damn phone. Uh, bayonets. This is the Charlieville bayonet, which some of them were up to 16 inches long. <sighs> what the heck is that? Bill's getting calls at the pub, huh? Yeah. They're yeah. asking if the pub's open. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the uh, Brown Best bayonet. The light, and... Uh, I don't know if you notice on the barrel, there's a lug. It almost looks like a sight in some spots, but it's, it just slides on and locks into place. Before that, they had plug bayonets, which would not stay in the barrel. But, uh, and the, it was a three-sided blade, which is, causes a, a terrible wound. It, it will not heal up, it's, and it just bleeds. And it can figure these, these two edges would be sharpened. And as you, if you're pushing it in, it, it just widens the wound, and it just can't be closed up. So you you could bleed to death even with a minor wound if you're not uh, taken care of right away. 
So then we go back to where we were again, to the uh, cartridges. Uh, in the 17th century, the army started using paper cartridges, they, but they were just the, the cartridges and they'd keep the ball separate in a bag or in a pocket even. Uh, and this is a, just how some of them would do it. This for revolutionary war, by the time that comes around, they're putting the ball in the cartridge with the powder and tying it together to hold it together. And here's a, a, just a clear view of the whole thing, ball, powder. And uh, so they would uh, prime the pan pour the rest of the powder down and push the, bar the ball in with the, uh, with the ramrod. There's another spot. And here's one that a friend sent, and he uses these for hunting, actually. You can actually sometimes, I don't know some people who, who grease these, so it gives you a little more, uh, gives you some uh, lubrication on the barrel when you're shooting. Uh, so going back to the, uh, Minuteman uh, regulations, they had to have the balls to fit their gun, a pound of powder at least, but that would usually be issued uh, in a canteen or they would call them uh, water bottles. And uh, in that specific Massachusetts one, I won't go back to it, mentioned single hoop, uh, which is just kind of, they call it, these are called cheese box style, which is probably a modern. Uh, I make these, by the way. Uh, it's, it's considered a New England style, and it was probably because they had so many uh, shingle mills around, they were already splitting wood thin, and uh, so they already had the technology to do this. Uh, and cheaper to make, uh, apparently the uh, tin canteens were not abundant, uh, the ones that were still left in the armories, and uh, so it was easier to, to make, and they would maybe last for maybe one season, if, if that. Uh, then they also had to have a belt with a cutting it or a fighting knife or a tomahawk or some people still carried swords. Uh, and, the, and this is a tool belt, a tool bag. Some of the types of tools, this is probably more tools than any they would probably carry. You probably have a mix of tools within a company so that if you had to repair things, you'd, this, this would be a, it's a ball puller actually. So if you have to remove a ball from it, uh, from the barrel, uh, you put, screw this onto the end of your ram or the ram roads had threaded tips, you'd screw that tool on and uh, push it down the barrel and just kind of tap it in and turn it into this screw. It's actually a screw and you'd pull it out. There's a cleaning uh, jag, just slightly smaller than the size of the barrel, would scrape off the fouling on the inside. Uh, another screwdriver, a file if you needed it. And uh, this is the British uh, musket tool, had two, two different screwdrivers on a and this is a worm. You can screw that onto the end of your uh, ramrod and uh, put some a rag on it or to tow with, to clean the rest, clean your barrel out. They would clean them with boiling water. Uh, that would, uh, until it came out clear, that would uh, dissolve all the salts left by the burnt powder. And there's that tool again. And then the pick and brush, remember we talked about keeping the touch hole clean. They had to have a wire or something that could be poked through that hole and keep it clean. A brush to clean out the pan and underneath the pan. I prefer a rag to that. And another two, here's another rug, different size worms for different calibers. This is a spring vise. If you needed to take the lock apart, you put that on, this, on, the, uh, on the outside. Let me just see if I can back up to that real quick. Right here, if you, one more. Back. What did that look? Well, here's a good spot. So if you wanted to remove, to, you take the tension off that spring with the spring vise, then you could take your frizzing off. Sometimes those would have to be rehardened. So to get them off, you'd have to take the tension off of it first, and then the screw would come out. Back down. And here we go, some more stuff, cleaning, cleaning uh, tool. This is the, like uh, any, they used to use a lot of uh, olive oil, which were they called sweet oil to oil the guns or any animal fat. This is a beef tallow mixed with a little bit of uh, beeswax and a rag. And this is brick dust. Uh, you could also use pumice, but brick dust was a lot very easily obtained. It was, I read one British regiment requesting more brick dust because they use it 
they used it all up. And like I said before, they overcleaned their weapons. So they used, if you're using something like brick dust, it doesn't take too long to wear those barrels down. When you're cleaning them constantly, uh, just to keep the people busy, uh, Remember, the barrels aren't that thick, and so there could be some thin spots, weak spots, and constant rubbing and, and of this abrasive would cause damage, actually, more damage than cleaning. Here's another, yeah, this is a, a quote I picked up off the uh, Continental Line Facebook page. Okay, so the next thing they had to carry was uh, a, uh, a knapsack with a, probably with a blanket. It, 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 you have to think about, uh, Minutemen were, they're like, they're like today's uh, volunteer fire department. Uh, a few people would be ready right away to answer the call or the alarm, uh, may not necessarily have a blanket. But by the time Cockett and Lexington came around, there was so much anticipation that some of these militias were practicing three times a week rather than two times a year. Uh, so they, they were ready, they were more than ready when the, when the time came. Uh, so they had to have, the, being cold, they probably would bring a blanket. I'm not sure if all of them would. Like I said, the, the Minutemen would respond first, be, being followed by the rest of the militia who might take a while to gather up and they would bring more supplies like extra blankets, food, tendage if they needed it. And is the, uh, this is just a simple militiaman pack. There's no adjustments here. It's just, just slide that on and it goes across your chest to, for t to keep it on, keep it tension. Some of the possible contents, you know, a bowl, a spoon, a small bag for food, extra socks, anything you actually you could carry uh, that you might need. I think some of the uh, requirements required them to have at least two days of rations with them. Um, and we had the cartridge box. A lot of the uh, militias uh, made their own or had somebody make them. Uh, the average, average one held about 17 rounds. This one holds 20. And uh, some of the, uh, you could, they were still using powder horns, but mostly to carry extra powder. Like this one would hold a pound. These would be priming horns. If you're gonna load from a powder horn, probably if you were hunting, you'd be loading from a powder horn. You'd put the, pull this off, or the powder into this hollowed out measure. This I think holds 90 grains, and then you could then you would pour that down the barrel. If you just loaded straight from this, especially in a barrel, you could still have sparks inside that barrel. And basically, what you're doing is you're holding a bomb in your hand. Uh, and then you try could prime the pan either with this or with the a finer pow priming powder. So that would take a while. So. And that gets me down to almost to the end. We're almost to the end. Am I going too fast, Julia? <laughs> no, One thing perfect. I too wanted to mention was uh, back from the beginning, the followers, uh, there were so many different guns. That, and also uh, in uh, 1774, Paul Revere wrote to uh, Portsmouth and warned them that the British were gonna come up and take the arms and ammunition out of Fort William and Mary, which was in Portsmouth. and. Uh, uh, this was December uh, 14th and 15th, so it's a good full four months before Bunker Hill and Lexington, before Lexington and Concord. Uh, and that's the reason Lexington and Concord was happy. They were going to do the same thing there, but they always had, they had enough spies so they, they knew pretty much what the British were doing most of the time. Uh, anyway, from the fort in uh, in Portsmouth, they took uh, 16 cannons and uh, I think 100, over 100 barrels of powder and I, I, a lot of muskets too, a lot of older muskets. So, uh, so that's why you have a So they did have some good military weapons uh, in the beginning, but not a whole lot. Not until the French started supplying us with the Charlie Bills. Hey, and Bill. Even then, what's well, that? Oh, Bill, I just had a question come in uh, about powder. Um, speaking of powder, uh, yeah. there, there happened to be a powder mill that was in Warren and, Cam and in Camden. Um, do you happen to know what role they played in the supplies for the weaponry of the time? Um, and what did they need to be, and why did they need to be on the river? Oh, uh, hmm. well, they probably used the river 
I'm not sure, but just for power, like a, a sawmill, because they had to grind some of these things out. I know there was a powder mill, there was a mill in Portsmouth, and all they made was the uh, nitrates part. Uh, then it'd have to get that and, and charcoal and put that. I think the charcoal would have to be ground fine and then mixed with your nitrates, and that's how you made the powder. Then you would grind that into different various sizes. Like uh, today we have like 4F, which is the finest, 3F, which is what you shoot maybe revolvers with, 2F was a little, little bigger. Uh, granule that's for your muskets and then one f for cannons and the difference is the rate of expansion you know uh, as opposed you know it, it it's a slow burner when you compare it to a modern cartridge you, that's why you can't use modern powder in a, in a black powder gun it'll just blow it up the the, in, the internal pressure is so great on a modern powder that, that uh, it would just simply blow a musket apart and uh, but the uh, pot, black powder would burn slower and that's we I think the reason on the river was just to get the power for the mill to grind those things down to the right size that they wanted. Uh, but that's a good question. Or you, oh yeah, or possibly I think um, we, we had a presentation about mills a couple weeks ago and, and actually the powder mill came up and I think he also said he suspected it had to do with mixing the ingredients as well. Just anytime you need that, probably, that, yeah. that power, um, the, the river could supply that. Uh, we actually had another question come in from Jackie and it says, um, where, and, and again, it's, this may have been answered, but it says, where was some of the central places in colonial times that gunpowder came in to restock? So what ports, I'm guessing, is what she might be asking. Uh, well, let's see. I think the southern ports weren't completely blocked off. Uh, Portsmouth was a good port because the British ships could not get up inside that harbor. So a lot of, uh, in fact, there were 100 pr privateers out of uh, Portsmouth. So if they could get into there, uh, it was easy enough to bring stuff in to, to resupply. Some of the southern ports you could, but New York wasn't open until for quite a while until we till the British left it. Uh, so uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, wherever they could get in. But I think you might find more of the production down in the southern colonies than in the northern colonies. Not sure. There probably was plenty around, but it too, even at that point, it was, they were getting scarce because before that they were importing the bulk of their powder. Uh, so it was difficult to make enough to get through. They had to also rely on the French for powder once they, they get in. Uh, is there any more questions on that? The, not about that. I'll, uh, we have a few more questions that came okay. in, but I'll let you keep going with the slideshow and then I'll ask the rest okay, of we're the Okay, we'll just go through the rest of it then. So the next thing would be the firing sequence. Uh, uh, to train a new recruit, it was uh, like almost uh, 20 parts. It would, it would be done by the numbers. That those who have been in the service by the numbers, literally they had uh, probably 20 different movements on how to, to load. But after they were drilled into them, until they were dreaming about it. Uh, the, the simple command was prime and load. Uh, but it, there's uh, quite a few movements. When you're trying to train people to do it in a uniform method and quickly, that, that's how they had to do it. So this would be, the first one would be to open your pan. Uh, you're gonna, first you're gonna put it on half cock, which is the safety, then you open the pan. And the next one would be handle cartridge. And then, an important thing was you had to have at least two opposing teeth <laughs> to tear that off. You'd tear that off, prime the pan with a little bit of it, maybe a little more than that, shut the pan. Then when they, the next order was to come about, you here he is shutting the pan, you pour the powder down, and in some cases you'd have the ball separate, and, and like I said before, they would. And remember, these are undersized balls. I don't think I mentioned that before. You have a 75 caliber weapon. You're not using a 75 caliber ball. I, for live shooting, I use a .715. And I know some people who use a, point, a 69 caliber. So you, you want it to go down easy. Otherwise, the, by the time you fired three or four shots, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult to ram it down and it's going to get stuck in the middle. And then your, your gun is unserviceable. So put that in and with the power, just push the ball in with the paper on it or separate and put it down and ram it all down with the rammer, which is right here. Ram it down to right to the bottom. And then you'd probably come to shoulder. The next one would be make ready. And that's when you pull it to full cock. 
and then it was either present or take aim. And then for the next one, everybody has to say boom, boom. <laughs> and this, uh, this brings us almost to the end, except we've got some uh, shameless plugs coming up. Unless you want to do some questions first. No, go ahead with your shameless plugs first. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the book by, and uh, Dennis Hambacken did all the photography and uh, uh, layout. And uh, a lot of this stuff is explained in detail inside with all the equipment and, and weapons. And then we have, uh, this is my, if you are, if I'd like you to order the book through my email or through this, you can order the canteens or the book through this uh, website, oh, back it up, uh, for both uh, or either. Otherwise, if it goes through Amazon, I don't get paid. <laughs> Well, the craftsmanship That's on cool. your on the craftsmanship on your canteens is it's gorgeous. They're so well done and so well put together. My husband has one, and I think my father in law as well. So yeah, I can, sh I can, shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, I can back up to the picture, I suppose. Oh. <laughs> so the next one is uh, these are some of the other books that Dennis Hambuck and this is my son. He did one on uh, Confederate soldiers and as a Union soldier. He also did one on World War II D Day. This is the latest one, uh, Battle of the Bulls. And I think he's working on one for uh, Pacific Theater of World War II. And uh, I couldn't get in touch with him, but I could, if you Google him, you can get all, I can get all, all on, on, uh, on Amazon anyway. And again, we have the book as well. And the images, the photographs, it's it's a very pictorial book. It's a very, you know, this the one images here are the big one I, and bold. Yeah. The, the, the one that you helped, yeah, um, right. helped out with. The pictures are great. They're clear. They're close up. You you really get a good sense of, of what the equipment looked like. And, um, yeah. and you guys did a great and, job with that. And these two books here, you interviewed uh, uh, probably 20 or, th or more individuals who took part in these battles. And that's, that's an interesting part about mm. it. Because, uh, in another few more years, there won't be any of them left. Uh, I don't know if Dennis is watching tonight. I, I sent him the email. I didn't want to put his, e his email down without his permission. So. No, no. Well, we, can, <laughs> we can get you all connected. Are, yeah. are you ready for, oh, oh we got a couple uh, well, more. A couple more. Here's another, this is, these are some interesting books. Uh, Paul Revere's ride goes into the politics of Boston just before uh, Concord and Lexington and the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, very interesting and very well done by Fisher. And then we have another one done by Nathaniel Philbrick, who's done quite a few books just on Bunker Hill. But he, he centers around uh, Dr. Warren, who was uh, killed at Bunker Hill. He was supposed to be in charge of the whole New England army within about another month, but he got killed. So he didn't. And Saratoga, another very good book, because this is a General Burgoyne's march down through. Uh, Champlain. He had a good plan, but he didn't follow his own plan. So he ended up, this was a key turning point of the war uh, for, uh, for our cause. Anyway, he lost a 15,000 man army in that, in that ex expedition there. So it was a, a bad defeat for the British, an embarrassing defeat. Uh, I think that's the, oh, here's another one. Penobscot expedition for people who are living in the area. That was up until Pearl Harbor, this was the worst U.S. naval disaster in American history. And it all took place within 40 miles of Camden. And so the retreating troops came down through Bangor, down through Camden. And there's, some, there's a lot of interesting uh, stories about that. And so and another thing, I think I missed this. this is my, the snowshoeman.com, that's the group I belong to. We do four impressions. Uh, early and late 17th century, uh, French and Indian War, uh, and uh, Revolutionary War. And they're on Facebook. That's a new, both on both places. This is what we're going to start with Julia, myself, uh, Eric, and, and uh, Ben Pierce. We're going to start a new group called Troops of Camden. We're thinking of doing uh, Camden Militia, but there's it limits us too much. I think there's quite a few militias uh, in the area, and a lot of them took part in the Penobscot ex expedition. Uh, then we have the Colonel Paul Wentworth House. That's also on Facebook. So please check those out. And that gets us to the end.
<laughs> All right. Well, we've got about 10 minutes or so for some questions, and a few of them have come in. Um, okay. The first one says, what is the difference between a flintlock and a snafaus, snafaus? A snafaus was an earlier 17th century style. Uh, oh, could, that's a good idea. To I'm thinking about doing a, um, a similar talk on 17th century. I don't think I have a, I don't have a picture of it. But we can go back to the uh, lock if we can find it. I can show you. Okay, uh, I'm wrong. this is close enough. Uh, Snafons was, uh, you have to go, it's, it's hard to explain because, well, the French in 1610 actually came out with what we call the true flintlock, but the English were still fooling around with the match locks, wheel locks. And then snap on. So wheel lock was a had a it was almost like a clockwork. You had to wind it up, and it's very similar to the, a, a modern lighter where you flick it and you had that little wheel that rubs on that flint and makes the sparks. So same same me mechanism, but in a bigger way. They would wind it up and pull the trigger and it would flop down onto the wheel. The, the pyrite was what they used to make a spark. And but it's I should have put a picture in those. If you want to look that, you can you can Google it and some good, pretty good pictures. There's also a guy named, last name is Bolek, he's in Poland. You can look him up on uh, Facebook and he makes some fabulous looking ones. I think, uh, but the snap ones was uh, the next step from the wheel lock, but still cumbersome, you know, and, and all this time they're doing this, uh, the French are using this, the, the more superior lock. and, and and I guess who they're giving them, they're giving them to the Indians to fight us with. Uh, I should say Native Americans. Anyway, so that's, uh, that would be the main difference. They're basically the same, but the snap ones really kind of worked backwards. Uh, let me try to get back to that again. I want to so it that. was just not quite as, it was just an earlier version of the earlier same Earlier version, if I can, oh, we're too far up. I can't find it. All right, we've got another question came in. It says, you may have mentioned this in the beginning, I, but I missed it, um, but what was a blunderbuss? Oh, blunderbuss was the, they called them coach guns. It was a short barreled, but very, almost an inch. It was mostly like a scatter gun. They used them on ships uh, when they boarded. They could, they could put, they could like put a bunch of buckshot in, nails or whatever they wanted, and, and it would just blast. It didn't have a good range, it was just, scatter shit, all, uh, crap all over the place. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, caused some damage anyway. Uh, and also use them as coach guns because they're like a shotgun. You didn't have to really aim too well and you wouldn't want to be on the business end of it uh, because it did throw a lot of stuff at you. Mm. Uh, but it was really short, maybe uh, two feet long. Uh, it was mostly a, a defensive weapon really. Okay, we have another comment that came in. This one um, kind of harkens back to our comment, our conversation earlier about the uh, black powder. And this is from Greg. It says, supply of black powder was always a major issue for the Continental Army. Industry in the colonies struggled to ever produce enough and raw ingredients were in short supply. And Greg's included a little link, which I think probably takes you, right. if you were interested uh, in, in finding out a little bit more information about that. Um, yeah, that'd be good, yeah. Yeah, James has a comment and it says, Philbrick is wonderful, and I agree. <laughs> um, Paul Revere's record was not the greatest, uh, no. and, but he says, thank you. Um, and William says, thank you, very nice presentation. Oh, well, um, thank I, you. I agree, I think that was very informative. And again, as someone who's handled these weapons myself, uh, or, you know, Lisa Brown Bess, and my husband is a fowler. Um, yeah, they're 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 complex. They're and yet simple at the same time. But um, there's a lot to them, and it's exciting to kind of understand a little bit more about how they worked. And um, yeah. you know, again, it, this is something that, that comes up often when people talk about gun laws. Um, you know, this is what the this is what our founding fathers were using when they came up with all these all their their thoughts about laws and and, um, and being armed. Uh, yeah, and how far we've come today with with weaponry. It's it's just it's amazing to conceptualize um, yeah. fighting fighting wars with these weapons. Um, but again, Bill, thank you so much. This was some great information. We're having a bunch of thanks coming into the chat box. Uh, uh, no, any more questions at all? No. No, I think that's it. It says thank you and good evening from Scotland. Oh wow, that's really? far wow. away. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. 
Um, so this is a great time to just remind folks in case they signed on late. Uh, we have recorded this program this evening and we will be putting it on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel. So if you have any difficulty locating the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel, just send me an email. I'm the person who sent you the link to this program. Um, we do a lot of programs like this. So check librarycamden.org. You're always welcome to join us. They're free and they're a lot of fun. So with that, I thank you one more time, Bill, and I thank wish you. everyone a great evening. Good night. Thank you, everybody, and, and, and cheers. Yeah, huzzah. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good night.